Welcome to People, Places, Planet Pod, the official podcast of the Environmental Law Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization working to ensure a healthy environment, prosperous economies, and vibrant communities founded on the rule of law. Welcome to this week's episode of the People, Places, Planet Podcast. My name is Sarah Backer, and I'm your new host. Today, I am joined by ELI staff attorney Jared Page and science fellow John Doherty, who both work on ELI's Climate Judiciary Project, or CJP. In collaboration with leading national judicial education institutions, CJP develops and disseminates a climate science and law curriculum and other educational programs to provide neutral, objective information to the judiciary about the science of climate change and how that science is relevant to current and future litigation. In this episode, the CJP team will turn to the case of Held versus the state of Montana. For context, in 2020, 16 young Montanans filed a complaint against the state for violating their constitutional right to a healthy environment as part of a suite of youth-led constitutional climate lawsuits around the nation. On August 14, Judge Kathy Seeley ruled in favor of the plaintiffs in a decision that is being framed as a landmark lawsuit for climate litigation. Jared and John will speak to how climate science was integrated into the case and the implications Held versus Montana has for the future of climate litigation. Jared and John, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for having us. So to start, can you provide background for our listeners on youth-led constitutional climate lawsuits in the U.S.? Sure. There have been more than 2,300 cases related to climate law, policy, and science filed in the last couple decades. And there's been an upward trend the last few years in particular. Most of these have been in courts in the United States, but they've been brought on numerous legal theories. One category, as you mentioned, Sarah, is the youth-led constitutional climate cases. These have been relatively high profile, but it's worth noting that these cases are one sliver on a pie chart that shows all the various pieces of climate change-related litigation. In the United States, the Oregon-based nonprofit Our Children's Trust, who represented youths in Held versus Montana here and youths in similar cases, has filed these types of cases in all 50 states, and they've supported cases in other countries too. Perhaps their most well-known case, and one that our listeners may know, is Juliana versus United States, which is actually still ongoing in federal court. And one reason folks are describing held as a landmark lawsuit, as you mentioned, is because it's the first of these youth-led constitutional cases to go to trial. And in this case, the youth plaintiffs won. Can you lay out what the plaintiffs and defendants arguments were? The arguments have evolved over the course of the case, but at bottom, plaintiffs were arguing that a particular Montana state law violated their constitutional right under the Montana Constitution to a clean and healthful environment. More specifically, that state law was part of the Montana Environmental Policy Act, And the provision at issue, Judge Seeley described as the MEPA limitation, MEPA standing for Montana Environmental Policy Act. And that limitation forbid any state agency from considering greenhouse gas emissions or climate impacts when conducting an environmental review. So, for instance, when looking at the impacts of a coal mine expansion project, state officials were barred from looking at the climate dimensions of that decision. The plaintiffs said that that limitation went too far and the state's failure to consider various climate impacts that were resulting from additional fossil fuel projects that contributed to climate change and resulted in numerous injuries to them, to the plaintiffs. And these injuries included, as Judge Seeley stated in her opinion, injuries to physical and mental health, homes and property, recreational, spiritual, and aesthetic interests, tribal and cultural traditions, economic security, and happiness. For the defendants, what their argument was, I'll let John mention some of the evidence offered at trial, but one argument they made successfully earlier in the trial had to do with the remedy requested. 
So initially, plaintiffs requested that the court issue an injunction, which is basically an order that would direct a state agency to make emissions reductions in this case. Judge Seeley rejected that request, saying it would be outside the bounds of the role of a court. So what changed from then until now was that plaintiffs were no longer requesting that injunction. And instead, they asked the court for a declaration on the constitutionality of that law, of that MEPA limitation I mentioned a moment ago. Just lastly, I think one thing some lawyers might find interesting is what the defense did not argue at trial. As con law students know well, for constitutional cases involving fundamental rights, governmental defendants must show a, quote, compelling interest in the law at issue and that the law is, quote, narrowly tailored to meet that interest. And notably, the defendants didn't argue or put forward any evidence that the MEPA limitation met a government interest. Thanks, Jared. I'll just add that for the defendants, it seemed to me that the main factual argument that they made at trial was that the state of Montana's emissions are insignificant. That is, if Montana were to stop emitting all of its greenhouse gases, then it wouldn't have a discernible impact on mitigating global climate change. Now, we might get into this a little bit later, but that was countered by the scientists who provided expert testimony on behalf of the plaintiffs, who drew upon the work of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, which is the UN's main body for assessing climate science and is largely recognized as the world's leading authority on climate science. And harnessing reports from the IPCC and also other reports that we'll discuss later on, these experts argued that every ton of CO2 matters and also provided a number of comparisons between the emissions of the state of Montana and other U.S. states and even other countries around the world for a comparative analysis of their kind of per capita emissions. Jared, returning to your earlier point. So what is a constitutional right to a healthy environment? And how many other states grant that right? Well, good question. And um, it depends on the definition, really, as to how many states grant a constitutional right to a healthy environment, but not that many. So it's really a handful, give or take one or two, depending, again, on who you ask. These types of amendments are usually referred to as environmental rights amendments or green amendments. These green amendments secure a fundamental and inalienable right to a healthy environment, typically through clean air, pure water, clean land, etc. for present and future generations. And the environmental rights amendments or ERAs, as they're referred to, of Pennsylvania, Montana, and Hawaii are often referenced as among the most protective, although the exact language varies from state to state. New York, in fact, was the most recent state to add an ERA to its state constitution just a couple of years ago. In general, though, I think there's a couple of things to keep in mind. And first, not all ERAs are created equal. And so cases that involve environmental rights amendments require both the parties and the judge to closely consider the language that's in those provisions to determine things like who can enforce a right to a healthy environment? Against who will that right be enforced? What environmental media does that right include? Does it include air, water? Does it include climate? And so on. And I think the second thing that's important to keep in mind here is Although less than 10 states currently have these environmental rights amendments, a dozen or more states are in various stages of considering their adoption. This is very much a fluid area of law. I would encourage listeners to check out our educational modules from the Climate Judiciary Project. Our website, cjp.eli.org, has a specific module on fundamental rights where you can learn a lot more about this topic and other topics related to climate science and the law. And I will definitely link that below so this way our listeners can get to that more easily. So let's turn back to John and really dive into the climate science that was incorporated into this case. John, can you speak to how the case centered climate science? The plaintiff's arguments rested very heavily on climate science. And at trial, 
they drew upon the expert testimony of several scientists. And I think a few of those are worth kind of exploring in a little bit more detail. So first, the plaintiffs called Professor Steve Running, Professor Emeritus at the University of Montana, and really a world-leading climate scientist that's been involved with the IPCC since its early days. And Professor Running provided kind of a basic overview of climate science, a climate science 101, which included education on the greenhouse effect, Earth's energy balance, and how we know that human activity is responsible for causing current climate change. The plaintiffs then called Professor Kathy Whitlock of Montana State University. And Professor Whitlock was an important witness because she was actually the lead author of a report called the Montana Climate Assessment, which was a consensus report put together in 2017 that outlined the various ways in which climate change impacts Montana, including its impacts on specific climate hazards like wildfires. And in her testimony, she dove into all of those details and also touched on the impacts that those climate change impacts were having on the youth plaintiffs. The plaintiffs also called Dr. Lori Byron, who's a pediatrician and a co-author on a report called Climate Change and Human Health in Montana, which was also published by the Montana Climate Assessment. And Dr. Byron offered more details about the effects that climate change has had on the physical health of the children filing the lawsuit. Much of the health impacts that were highlighted by Dr. Byron included information about how smoke from wildfire can exacerbate underlying health and respiratory conditions like asthma, which some of the plaintiffs suffer from. And expert testimony previously had established that wildfires in Montana had grown more severe and frequent due to climate change and were projected to worsen in the future. Peter Erickson was then called of the Stockholm Environment Institute, and Erickson is really an expert in the field of greenhouse gas accounting. This is the field of study that attempts to quantify the greenhouse gas emissions of a source, like the state of Montana, for example. And his testimony was key because, as I mentioned previously, really the main factual argument from the defendants was based on the idea that Montana's emissions were insignificant. So Erickson's testimony, he put together a report using what's called a full life cycle approach to estimate the carbon dioxide emissions from the state of Montana, not all of the greenhouse gases, but carbon dioxide. And in this sort of full life cycle approach, Erickson was looking at emissions from the state of Montana related to fossil fuel extraction, transportation, processing, and consumption for energy. So that's what we mean by full life cycle, looking at the full extent of how fossil fuels emit carbon dioxide during their life cycle. And using that approach, Erickson found that Montana has the sixth largest per capita greenhouse gas emissions of all of the U.S. states. And Erickson also found that Montana, which has a population of one million, has around the same level of CO2 emissions as Pakistan, which has a population of 248 million, Argentina with a population of 47 million, and the Netherlands with a population of 18 million. Finally, Erickson concluded in his testimony that Montana has only scratched the surface of its fossil fuel reserves. So it's extracted 24 of the 707 million tons of its coal, 23 out of 298 million barrels of its oil, and 43 billion out of 613 billion cubic feet of its natural gas. The last expert that I want to highlight here is Professor Mark Jacobson of Stanford University. And Professor Jacobson's professional research really focuses on the energy transition and looks at how different areas like states and countries can transition to 100% renewable energy by 2050 to align with net zero emission goals. And pointing actually to a 2018 report from Montana State's own Department of Environmental Quality, Jacobson went on to talk about the significant potential for solar energy that exists in the state of Montana, and also wind potential, the space that would be required, and the co-benefits of transitioning to a renewable energy system like cleaner air. And importantly, 
Jacobson argued that the barriers to renewable energy in Montana are not technical or economic barriers, but political ones. And that was a point that was also noted in Judge Seeley's decision on this case. Thanks, John. So ultimately, what was the decision that was made? At the outset of the decision, Judge Seeley determined that youth plaintiffs had standing to bring their lawsuit in the first place. And standing means that there was a concrete harm to the plaintiffs, that those harms could be traced back to actions of the defendant. And lastly, that the court had authority and the ability to grant relief that would help to remedy those injuries. After determining that the plaintiffs had standing, Judge Seeley found that the MEPA limitation that we talked about earlier was unconstitutional. It ran afoul of the Montana state constitution. And ultimately, that means that state officials can no longer take any actions in accordance with that limitation. That means environmental reviews in Montana can now be done in a way that considers greenhouse gas emissions and climate impacts. In reaching her decision, Judge Seeley interpreted the Montana Constitution's clean and healthful environment and environmental life support system. Those two phrases, she interpreted that language as including climate. She based that decision on the fact of the language of the provisions themselves, the intent of the people who crafted the constitutional provisions, She heard from folks who were at the 1972 Constitutional Convention and other cases from the Montana Supreme Court. What does this mean for energy projects in the state of Montana going forward? Well, for one thing, it means that the environmental review that is done for any particular energy project, it means that greenhouse gas emissions of that project can now be considered. And another thing, going back to what John remarked earlier in the testimony from Dr. Jacobson, is the renewable future in Montana is technologically feasible. And the obstacles to implementing a renewable future in Montana are political. We can't say for sure what exactly the ramifications for Montana energy policy will be. It's likely that greenhouse gas emissions will be considered in some of these environmental reviews of energy projects in the state. So has this been framed as a landmark lawsuit because the plaintiffs were successful for the first time? I think in part, yes. And as we mentioned earlier, you know, this is the first youth-led constitutional climate case to go to trial. And while many others of the Our Children's Trust cases have been dismissed before they made it to trial, Mike Gerard, who's a law professor at Columbia and an expert on climate litigation, has stated that he thinks this is, quote, the strongest decision on climate change ever issued by any court. And it shows that enforcing a fundamental right to a stable climate can be done, but I might also add a bit of caution here. The outcome of this case, I think, was very particular to the facts. On the one hand, you have a state with a very sort of strong and protective environmental rights amendment, which we talked about before, one of the strongest in the United States. And on the other hand, we have this MEPA limitation, a state law that forbids a state agency from even considering greenhouse gas emissions, which itself is somewhat unique. And there aren't a lot of analogs to that type of state law. So we have unique state law and a unique environmental rights amendment that came together in this particular case in a way that might not be applicable in other cases, for example. But I think it's also a landmark lawsuit at least for the Climate Judiciary Project, in that the opinion features an extensive discussion of consensus climate science. And it includes substantially more engagement with climate science than many other climate cases. Judge Seeley is remarkably clear in stating in her opinion that there's an expert consensus. And in her words that, quote, dangerous impacts to the climate are occurring due to the extraction and burning of fossil fuels. How might this expert consensus impact the future of climate litigation nationally? Well, I think the first thing that's important to keep in mind is this decision isn't happening in a vacuum. And so while it is happening in a state court in Montana, and so the ultimate decision isn't necessarily, you know, legally binding on other courts outside of the state in other litigation, 
But many legal observers are really calling this decision the beginning because it's likely to encourage or inspire climate rights cases, both in other states and around the world. And just to note that the plaintiffs in Juliana, the Juliana versus United States case that we mentioned in the beginning, which is still ongoing, they submitted a brief of supplemental material right after this decision in Held versus Montana that was sort of pointing the court in that case to this decision and saying, I know it's not binding on you, but look, here's one example of one court and what they did and what they said. I think we can expect to see many other cases and plaintiffs sort of pointing to this decision as meaningful and one that people should be paying attention to. So what is next for this case? Well, it's likely that the defendants will take an appeal and that appeal will be to the Montana Supreme Court. As of the recording of this episode, there hasn't been an appeal yet filed with the Montana Supreme Court, but the defendants have indicated that it is their intention to do so. And so I think we can expect the next step in this case to be before the Montana Supreme Court. And we'll sort of be waiting to see what they say and what they do with respect to the case. In addition to watching for the trajectory of this case, are there any particular cases that we should be looking out for next? The next Youth-led constitutional climate case that's closest to trial is in the state of Hawaii, and that one is scheduled to go to trial sometime next summer. Our listeners could probably expect that case. It's called Navaheen F versus the Hawaii Department of Transportation. I think they can expect that case to be the one that people are sort of looking to next on the horizon from the youth-led constitutional climate case category. Thank you, Jared and John, for joining me today. And I hope to have you back to discuss the Hawaii case and also well before that. Thank you, Sarah. Great to be here. Sounds good, Sarah. Thanks for having us. Thank you for tuning in to People, Places, Planet Pod, brought to you by the Environmental Law Institute. We would like to hear from you. So please send us your questions, comments, and ideas to podcast at ELI.org. And if you're interested in learning more about our work, attending one of our events, reading our publications, or becoming a member, please visit our website at www.eli.org.